on our strategic plan and all in our vision for the institution as well as our goals. We want to make sure that we, are, we have the, the most up-to-date cutting-edge technology here at Western. And as you know, with, the, with our financial situation, it is always difficult in terms of keeping up, particularly when it comes to cost, the cost of technology. So it's, 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 it's a challenge for us, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're doing all that we can do to make sure that we have the cutting edge kinds of technology uh, here at Western Illinois University. This past summer, we did a lot in terms of with the bandwidth and, and, and a lot of different things in terms of enhancing the technology here, and we want to continue to do that. So we're very pleased to be here to host, uh, well, I don't want to say hosting, uh, right. And uh, I feel like I'm in court today. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, I want to turn it over uh, to uh, Stephen so that he can talk briefly about, uh, make some remarks and about what this is all about. So we, we have this mic passed around. It's, uh, yeah. it, it's really great to see everybody here. Uh, it's tremendous turnout. We really appreciate you being here. And time is really limited. We have six proposals that we're going to consider here today, so I'm going to keep my uh, remarks very brief. Back in March of 2013, we started developing a framework for IT governance and also a plan for implementation. A year later, in March of 2014, um, President Jack Thomas announced the formal implementation of IT governance, which makes the entire uh, university community a full-fledged partner in IT decision making. This auspicious occasion today, when the very first time that this council is meeting, is a culmination of a lot of planning and hard work by a lot of people over a 20 month period. But this is not the end. In actuality, it's the beginning. As IT governance continues to evolve, mature, and become a fabric of our institution. I'd just like to take a moment to thank the president and his leadership team for their support for all of those who have been involved in the IT governance process and the planning. Thank you. And for each and every one of you that are here today, thank you. Justin Elric, who is the chair of the executive committee, is going to be facilitating our meeting here today. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, David. So I'm going to give you an introduction to how this process works for those who are new to this. So the IT governance proposal system, proposals come in from the community, they get assigned to an alliance by the executive council. That's the, that's the, council, that's the committee that I'm the, uh, the chair of. And then we have three alliances here. So the instructional scholarly, we have the administration and the marketing, marketing external alliance. These alliances will vet the uh, proposal, develop that proposal, um, and then take ownership of the proposal to move it up back to the executive committee, which then brings it to the review process. Reviewers make sure that, that it's, with, it's within line of legal requirements or technical requirements of the university. And then finally, those proposals are brought up to the IT Governance Council, which is why we're meeting today. So as a brief, up, as a brief update of where we stand, we have seven pre-proposals right now being considered uh, by the alliances. So in this stage is when we're vetting these, these, these proposals. So we're asking for feedback. These are all um, public meetings. So if you're interested in these proposals, please provide feedback during these meetings or to the chairs of these alliances. And everything's available on itgovernance.wiu.edu, all under the GPS system. So you can follow these proposals as they go through the system. Uh, we have a couple of exp expedited, expedited uh, proposals coming through the system. So these are have already been funded. These are usually local local uh, proposals, so they don't have a lot of, of effect over the campus. Um, we have 15 that have been fully accepted by the expedited uh, committee, and these proposals are going through at this time. We do have two that are currently being reviewed by the uh, reviewers. Um, and then also we have two proposals out there right now that are very large in scope. and. One is the Adobe Cloud proposal, and so that's that's a proposal to get us to um, purchase, to license the Adobe Cloud for every computer on campus. 
That is currently being looked at by Patrick Senate. CIT already reviewed this proposal and has approved that proposal. Uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock, they will be uh, discussing this proposal at the, the entire Faculty Senate. Uh, the Faculty Senate Executive Committee did uh, approve this, this proposal as well. Um, and that was with a, um, a survey that was conducted by the Faculty Senate Executive Committee. And they also did a, committee, or a survey for the laptop every student proposal. They found some uh, mediocre results from that survey, so they decided to reject that proposal. So that's our first real proposal being rejected from uh, GPS. And then finally, the most major proposal we have is Google Apps for Education. And so that's going to, if this goes through, it's going to replace Zimbra. Gmail's going to replace Zimbra. Google Calendar's going to replace uh, Calendar and Zimbra. And then finally, Google Drive will replace uh, the P Drive. And so we figure this is such a major scope that everybody should be involved with this. And um, I presented this to the uh, Student Government, Government Association. Uh, and tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, they're going to be discussing it and making a vote on an opinion. And then also, Faculty Senate will be discussing this tomorrow as well at 4 o'clock. And the Administration Alliance is, is taking a look at this from the perspective of the administration and the staff to see how it affects them. And so after we get opinions from all these, all these groups, we will finally present this to. Um, uh, the IT Governance Council, as long as each group does approve this. And so if you want to get involved with this, I highly suggest attending one of these meetings depending on who you are. Um, again, I have some email addresses up there, and all this is available on itgovernance.wiu.edu too. And then finally, today we have these six proposals. Um, we're going to try to get through all six of these today, so we're going to go really fast through them. Um, here's kind of the idea uh, of the timeline for each proposal. So we're going to bring, bring up somebody from each alliance to go over the proposal to the, um, uh, to the council. The council will ask questions from that, that uh, representative from the alliance. And then finally, if we have time, we're going to ask audience members to come up and give opinions that differ from the alliance. And these are opinions that we want to see opposition, basically. We want to see something on record. This is not the time to actually vet the proposal. That, is, that time has passed. That time is during the alliance, the, the alliance stage. So this is just a time just to be on record what your thoughts are on this proposal. But again, we have to stay within, uh, within a, a timeline. So I'm, I'm thinking about nine minutes per, propo per proposal. Um, if we don't get through all of them, then we'll have to just postpone those proposals to next, to next week. And then finally, uh, the council is going to meet independently, make meet privately to actually make decisions on the proposals, and then it will finally go up to the um, the owner of IT governance for a final decision. Okay, we can get started with the first one, which is approval of the updated university password policy. So I believe that was under the IS alliance of the uh, the IS alliance. Would you like me to stand? You can either have a up to you. Usually, uh, you can sit up here if you want. Proposal number 45 was an updated university password for policy. It was proposed by Michael Rodriguez at QTAS. Pardon me? Yeah. It's actually easy. If we have everybody stand up there, we can do that too. Updated university password proposal policy um, proposed by Michael Rodriguez. Basically, the proposal is designed to better define the process control in place that will govern password use across the university. Um, it clarifies the distinction between process controls and use policy that are currently gathered into one document at this point. And the proposed changes will help refine and strengthen existing security and password design and renewal practices by minimizing network security risks and increasing user satisfaction. And basically what it does is people will go through a training process, and after they complete that training process, they're no longer required to update their password one time a year instead of every three months. People can opt out of the training. They'll be required to continue to practice every three months, 90 days, to update their policy as current standards. I invited all the proposers, so if they're not here, yeah, Michael's not here. Okay, that's fine. I, I can see that he's not there. <laughs> so I'll entertain any questions that I can. That I can. Um, this was deemed a very low risk, low cost um, implementation.
information that would increase user satisfaction by um, allowing people to go through a short training process and then only update their password once a year. So from the user standpoint, I know that would be widely anticipated. Okay. So now, <coughs> explain the uh, mechanism by which the training would come about. Uh, you know, when we have to change our password, something flashes up and, and tells you to do something. Would it be like that? To my understanding, it would be an online training that you would receive um, an invitation to once a year. It doesn't specify the delivery system now. It would be an online training and you would be notified based on your faculty, student, or staff status. So it would be distributed in that way. We're always concerned about security. What about security? I know we have to change it often for a reason, but what about uh, it being secure? Do you have any Yeah. Well, I, mean, it's, yeah. I just, I'm the messenger here. I know the background <laughs> issues of why, I mean, I could dig down deeper into the proposal and pull out the risks and security factors, but it might be easier to turn you over some of this work on it. There's a little confusion, I think, perhaps. There's, there's two policies that are both dealing with passwords. One is looking, the, the original uh, number 45 is looking at moving us to a 12 character password. That's the one that came from Mike Rodriguez. There's another one that's number 46, which is the one I put up about the phishing. And that's the one that would do the training. If, if, you, train, if, if you do the training, um, then you could extend your password reset window to one of year. So, so there's two policies. 46. Yeah. Th there's one policy about 12, 12 character password. That's policy number 45. And then 46, which is the one that would say whatever the password policy is, we'll still abide by that, except you would have to just change your password every every um, year if you do the training. So that so might not answer your question specifically. Cool. But the 45 with the updated password policy, they'll be putting new encryption software in. When they put the new encryption software in, things will be more secure, which allows for 46. That take a training process and phishing techniques, something that happens to them often their online account, they would be allowed to use the 12 month password because we're safer. Before we couldn't offer a 12 month password because we didn't have the encryption about 45 we proposed. But we're looking at is a, a, an 8 character password or a 12 character password? The 12 character password would be the new implementation. Okay, um, Roger, would you come back up because we talked a little bit about this. Um, my understanding is the real danger in security, it's not the number of characters in the password, but it's because uh, people don't, do not know how to detect uh, security probes. And so can you talk a little bit about our discussion earlier today? Sure, yeah. Um, so, so there's a couple of ways that, that a password can be hacked. Right. So, so in, in, in the, the standard scenario, an eight-character password would take about a million times potentially to, to, to hack a password. If we don't have direct access into a system, it, um, if you have direct access into the system, you can apply a, a, a script that will try multiple passwords very quickly, uh, and, and really it, it becomes a non-issue if it's 12 characters. It's, it's not much, unless we're going to an exponential, uh, a huge password, it's, it's almost possible to guarantee security with even 12 characters. Um, the, phishing, the phishing one is, 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 you know, we can change, if, we, if you guys want to go with an eight character password, I know Mike, Mike was very animate about moving to an eight character password. Uh, if you guys know Fred Seaton that was here, and, uh, he, he worked at, at the center for a while, he, he often made the, the, the conjecture that it's not really breaking of passwords that's going to be the security risk is people falling for phishing schemes that is the security risk here at Westward. So that would be me logging into a website with my login password that looks legit and turns out it's not and somebody's got my credentials they can get logged in and, and do um, basically whatever they want. And that's why the training is the right. key here. It's not the length of the password. Right. right. <coughs> questions. On 45, is the password for all? Is it for email? Is it for e-com? Is it for mainframe? It would be all of the systems that could support a 
12 character password. I'm not sure about the MBS system. I don't think that's capable of supporting a, a 12 at this time. Okay. And then on 46, what, what is the expectation of user training? Is it an hour or is it? Um, the training is already, we've already built some training, and what I would like to do is see the training is, that, that's currently in place done. I, I, I would think it takes 30 minutes at this point. Uh, it does make you a lot more aware. It gives you actual screen captures. There's a quiz in the end about, you know, can you identify if this is a phishing scheme or not a phishing scheme. And it could be something that we could we could modify every year, so maybe next year we talk about password security and using special characters and things like that. And currently we have nothing in place to encourage training like that. Which this would do. But part of the issue is you can we can go further out to the encryption and we can make longer passwords. You're not safe about how you read them. It's not really going to happen. And so this is, I guess, an electronic carrot to get people to say, okay, you know, we're aware of what the dangers are, so we can be entrusted with the years' worth of security. Thank you. Well, I'm proposing for the statement that, that the, the cost is unknown at this point, and I know that some of the work has been done and so forth. Is it? Do you have any ballpark? I, I would estimate. We're, we're currently dumping, if you, if you uh, do the training, we're dumping your results into a database. I would expect the UTEC side of things to pick up from, from, from the database that we're using, and it would take about a day to implement, uh, an eight hour day. So that would be one person in eight hours. More questions? Yes, yes, the audience. Very secure with 12 letters, but I never remember what my 12 letter one was, so I got to really plop the white that in here too. But I'm sure I'm one of the older ones here, so uh, I would speak up for the eight letter one. Okay, any uh, questions? Opinions from the audience. Sorry, unfortunately, at this point, we can't ask any questions. Those questions were should have been asked during the alliance phase of the proposal. We just need a, alternative opinions right now. The rationale for the 8 versus 12 letter password can be found inside the GPS system under the proposal itself in the criteria. The proposal writer was not here today, and he'd be most qualified to make that distinction and specification. Anyone else? I combined 46 to 45. So let's go on to um, the university wide online public directory, uh, which was under the marketing external alliance. So, Sean, can you come up with an introduction to that? Good afternoon. Uh, proposal number 50 is the university wide online public directory. In addition to its internal directory of students, faculty, and staff, which requires econ credentials to access university posts, a public directory of students, faculty, at directory.wiu.edu. While the public directory renders current data, the university does not currently update the directory's functionality. As designed, the public directory leaves constituent information, especially email addresses, susceptible to automated spam files. IT governance proposal 50 aims to revise public directory functionality by eliminating large static lists of unprotected constituent data. The revised directory would provide legitimate users with access to information through a universally accessible searchable interface that provides limited numbers of search results. That's it from that time. Any questions? Can you be more specific about what would be in directory CS that this was Um I think let's see. Um, would include uh, name Title, department, and phone number for faculty and staff. Students would have, uh, of course, uh, they're protected by uh, FERPA, um, and 
opt in for students so they wouldn't have to be on the public directory if they didn't want to. But um, I don't know that uh, we actually got real, real specific about what the students, uh, student directory would be. We would have kind of defer, I think we would defer to the registrar in their education. We wouldn't eliminate it. It would. Um, it would be. Uh, it just wouldn't be. It wouldn't be available in static lists. Right now, you can click on the department and you see the whole department, and um, it's not search protected. Um, by search protection, what I mean is, if someone from outside the university, for example, wanted to look up you, Joe, they'd have to know something about you, your name, and there would only be. Um, there probably uh, be a certain number of characters that you'd have to put in. You can just put in R and get all the R's. Um, and they'd have to know something about you, and then the number of results that would be returned would be limited, so that wouldn't be a huge list that could be easily harvested. Any other questions? Does the audience have any opinions to provide? Wireless connectivity in the case of the Affinity Arts Studio. Proposal 52 is the wireless connectivity in the HPA 3D Arts Studios, uh, submitted by Professor Wright. HPA 3D art spaces are the space on campus where people do ceramic work, metal sculptures, wood sculptures, large installation type sculptures like that. And, and other studio classes, and it was renovated two years ago, but for whatever reason, um, it was not outfitted with wireless at that time. It's an interesting building because there's some places where you would definitely want connectivity, um, particularly classroom spaces. Um, other places like we looked at today, you might not want people you texting around the table saw. So, places, it's not a typical outfit. And it's not a typical building. Um, but it does require wireless connectivity for student, faculty, staff interaction with the outside world. Um, that said, the Alliance felt very strongly that this was something that would fall in line with academic enhancement on campus. And our technology programs in general as being a wired campus. Um, I walked through with a number of the team today um, looking at the facility and, and what's in place now. It looks like it will be a smooth transition. Um, that's about all the details that we really have. It was written into an earlier proposal, I think, that's in SysTech now for the original renovation. So the cost outfit at that time, two years ago, should be up to date. Um, we didn't run into anything major today, I don't think, that would divert from what's asked for here. In the proposal, it did ask for a router to be included if it was needed. I'm not sure. And, and so that was in this proposal already. That's about basically what it is. It's a pretty straightforward thing. They don't have any wireless access points around the building. Um, you can take your device in there and readily see that. Um, as an offset to this, I think that one of the things that they did do was they got everything up and ready with what they had two years ago. But we still have some kind of piggyback phone lines going on using traditional phone drop wiring when it could be easily converted to IP if the funds were available, that would be probably another proposal down the line that wasn't included in this. But the wireless connectivity and outfitting and infrastructure was included in the first one for whatever reason, it never happened. And so they would like to have that added to the facility. I'm not sure why it didn't happen or if it was. It is in the proposal. Okay. Any questions? Wireless is becoming an issue across the entire campus. Sure. Did, did the Alliance look at the possibility of doing the entire campus or uh, was it just this one site? This facility in particular has not been addressed by campus and classroom upgrades around campus like some of the other places have. Um, the Alliance in particular has not discussed um, growing the richness of campus-wide 
activity, but I would imagine that this is in the works as much as we can, considering we're buying more bandwidth. Um, certainly, fiber is going to be an issue going into some of these places. I know that by investigating what we did today, we see various grades of wiring from CAT 3 to CAT 6 and 7 in some places going in, di in different spots. Um, that, again, um, Mr. Fraser, would be a proposal that should be suggested, particularly by somebody on UTEC and Beta DIS S Alliance, um, to draft this to do a review of where we stand. Of course, it's a huge project, so does that answer your question? Based on other similar projects, can anyone here tell me how much it would cost? Dan here, who we've been putting in some of this stuff together. Well, you don't have to stick your neck out. I think right now it's, 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 so this, this 18,000 is just for the HPA, right? Yeah. yeah. Just, would it have been cheaper to do it on a renovated? Was anyone here when we um, renovated this facility, we put an enormous amount of money into it? And any idea why it wasn't done in Michigan? Understood that it was supposed to some it was supposed to happen, and I don't know how or what happened, why it never did happen. But um, you know, there was no connectivity at all for quite some time, and then there was phone issues. So I don't know what the whole connection problem was there. Sharon, uh, wireless was in the proposal. We don't. Yeah, like you said, we don't know why it didn't happen. It just yeah, turned up one day and we didn't have it. <laughs> yeah. I, I spoke to Duke and the other faculty who were teaching the building. They felt they needed this for classroom instruction and research. Uh, and uh, they do have Ethernet connect connectivity in the offices and the classroom, but there's no wireless. Uh, going, going into the facility at first um, and understanding, you know, traditionally how you wrap your mind around that, you wouldn't think maybe you need it. But I think that you do. And the reason is because it allows you to connect to information about art as you're creating that. And, and so I think it's very useful in that way. And I, I would say too that one of the main reasons that we use it and need or, or have a need for it is, is that basic research uh, aspect. Our, our students were, were highly visual and accessing imagery and, uh, and content is, is, is we're missing that. We have to either go over to another building Garwood to access those things, or I have to try to bring the, the individual student in my office to look at my computer to say, oh, well, this is the artist I'm telling you about, when it would be nice that we could pull it up in the classroom during a PowerPoint lecture, you know, you know, so. It's interesting because you've got the physical medium there, we used to use physical medium to research that, and to large monograph books, but now we don't do that so much. Now we expect it to be out there, we still haven't connected. There's no, there's no conflict with the power tools and that kind of thing. They're not accessing the, uh, uh, the no. kind of way while working with the... <laughs> it's, it's just a thought. But a thought yeah. that did cross our mind this morning is there's a lot more dust and residue yeah. and um, particle matter that goes up into the air. You know, there's ventilation. If you're talking about putting wireless points, you know, over a table saw or, or next to a welding machine. And so we worked that out, though. We found ways to, that you can cover those things yeah. to secure them. But it's a non-traditional space, and I think that non-traditionally thinking, we just didn't think to do it until we found a need. And when we find a need, then we try to make it. So. Uh, I think we can definitely see the need. It's just you know, why it wasn't done in the renovated building. And I see in here also that it talks about that they think that maybe it was going to come when I was reading it had to do with the department paying the identical cost. Maybe that's what it was. No. So I never really looked into detail to see where things happened and didn't happen based on why. And I'm sure there's a lot of reasons behind it. Um, but it seems like a nominal cost to improve that facility.
bring that portion of the technology up to the standard of the rest of it. All right, thank you. The next one is the Western Online License. was drafted by Roger Rehnquist of CITR. Um, Western, uh, Western Online's contract with Desire to Learn will be up within the next two years. Um, the proposal basically recommends that this would be a good time to implement those parties on campus that would be involved with either renewing that decision or migrating to a new system to begin that review process. DMCA and ATOA response calling procedure basically resolves, revolves around purchasing software that will better help us meet the requirements of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the Higher Education Opportunity Act. Um, it's basically a graduated automated response system software so that when people, and a, a graduated response system is when people make a violation of copyright or try to down some, with something that isn't their account gets flagged, and certain consequences happen each time they do it, and those consequences are increasing. Okay, so if you do it once, you get a no-no of maybe 24 hours or a warning, and then uh, over time, if you keep um, breaking copyright, doing peer-to-peer sharing, downloading things from BitTorrent, or movies or file sharing, then eventually your, your account is destroyed. But basically, this software will allow us to identify that, Copyright violations can occur two ways. They can you know, test them ourselves. Go to the mic, go to the mic sir. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we can explain it in detail. I'm just messing with you. Thanks, Sean. A copyright infringement can occur two ways. They can be determined in two ways. With our copyright clients, we can test them ourselves internally, and we can use a graduated response to inform uh, on violators and help them overcome their issue with copyright infringement. When it happens externally, the campus receives the NCAA notices from copyright holders. Um, in, in that case, we would <coughs> flag the system, kind of enter that in ourselves so that they can follow that same process. Currently, that's a manual process right now. Uh, it's requiring staff time to send the emails out to find the people. Um, and last count, I was told we would have 400 emails all day this semester. someone to monitor that and make a decision themselves whether or not it's something they should react upon or we're getting the notices from external sources. Is there an estimated fault for the client? Uh, there is, however, we already have the appliance. Um, the newer version which we had to, to procure uh, to remain current the standards comes with this new software automatically. So correct me if I'm wrong, I think that the ends here, I believe we are paying Have we approved the um, disciplinary steps? Uh, I remember you came to the cabinet and went with this. Is that already in place, or is that contention on the software being turned on? One of the things, one I think the third response is that we'll cut them off. They're internet access. They can still get access to anything on campus, and we tell them they have to come down and talk to somebody to do that. And then we're going to warn them if you do this again, then you're going to go. 
But that's in place right now, or is that we're contingent? We're, we're ready to do it, but it's just we're waiting for the approval of the policy before we start that process. So if a Platte City student got strike three, then would they be talking to the director of technology? They'd be talking to the designated member of USAC, somebody that we've trained in sort of what to say and talk to them about. Up there, they would. Right. Okay. We wouldn't have that. This is the proposal for putting the policy in place so that we can do this on the And the other thing to add is that the vendor is doing away with the simply monitoring here. They're actually going to this uh, graduated response. Graduated response seems to be the standard that most places are going to so that policies are um, enabled so that they're equitable across case to case. to if and when someone's internet access is taken away? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so thanks yeah, for clarifying that. that. <laughs> uh, the first step or two, they would just need to acknowledge that they had reviewed our policy and click a button that would re-enable that. Uh, the third offense would require them to speak to a designated representative who could ensure that they understood the policy. And the fourth time, uh, we're looking at that being potentially referred to the student judicial process. is that this is done by IP addresses, right? It, it, it tracks them by the IP address. So there was a concern that was raised about uh, shutting down computer labs, uh, computers, if people are downloading stuff on the computer labs. And so with those and the computer lab, computers that be exempted from the shutting down the computers. There are obviously some details that will need to be ironed out, but as I understand it, uh, it would still receive the pop-up notice on the it does track also the user ID, etc. Uh, but we, you know, we want to track this campus wide. We certainly don't want the labs being a mechanism for people to download copyrighted material. Any other feedback? Is there a faculty and staff component to all this? Just students? Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. This would affect every campus user. People that would normally, in the case of a student going through the student judicial process, a faculty or staff would go see the program. So that would be, uh, you know, farther down the line, so hopefully most people would uh, avoid that occurrence. Anything else? Yes. Yes, hello, everybody. My concern from a student's perspective would be that. Um, uh, to my understanding, this policy is the result of requirements through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act as well as the Higher Education Opportunity Act. And with the state of our financial affairs at the university, my concern would be that uh, you know we're working to actually minimize the cost and the impact of this um, uh, this mandate from the federal government to implement these policies. Um, obviously.
obviously this is going to cause some griping from the students, and uh, I would recommend that they certainly be involved in the process of implementing this uh, graduated policy, uh, or at least uh, receive some feedback possibly from the Student Government Association before it's put in place. That's the last of the proposals. So thanks everyone for attending and for your support. Great. Thank you, Mr. Members. That's it. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>